for the final part of your Roman unit. Uh, we're ready to begin. So last time we looked at the Flavian Amphitheater, better known as the Colosseum, and it, it's actually pretty close to this monument um, on one side of the Roman Forum. This is the Arch of Titus. <clears throat> it's a triumphal arch, and this would have been a special monument that could have been um, could have been approved by the Roman Senate to celebrate a victory of some general out in the provinces somewhere. And in this case, it was uh, dedicated to Titus, who had just returned from the from sacking Jerusalem. And so it was a very big deal. Those troublesome Jews over in uh, Judea had been nothing but troubles for uh, almost a century. And so finally the Romans went in and just sort of uh, destroyed the temple. So this was uh, built for a triumph, and a triumph is an exceptional parade where a general is allowed to bring his army, I believe, with weapons into the city to be celebrated by the Roman people so that, you know, it would be a big, big celebration. Um, and they would parade through the arch, and then the arch would stand there forever to remind people of the triumph. So this was the triumph of Titus. The year was uh, shortly after 81 CE, and there's just one single passageway. You can see this big arch there. There are engaged columns with uh, Roman composite capitals on them. Don't worry about that too much. What is of interest is on the inside of the arch. Let me show you where we're looking at because that's kind of a big jump. So there are panels up here on the inside of the arch that have relief sculptures on them. And this is one side and this is the other side. It's you really can't see anything in that picture, so that's why we have this enlargement. So um, this is one of the reliefs there that shows the Roman soldiers carrying away the trophies from the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And you can see up here the seven-branched candlestick, the menorah that represented their religion. Uh, these people up here are carrying a chest, which is always interpreted as being the Ark of the Covenant, which would have been standing in the temple until that time, or so some legends have it. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the actual location of the Ark of the Covenant because it seems to have disappeared. Uh, just putting it out there. So notice how the relief here. The figures closer to us are popping out further from the background, so they're higher relief, and the figures further away are much lower relief. This is the, uh, the Roman attempt at illusionism with relief sculpture to make it look like it's very deep or as real as possible. And <clears throat> here again is just a reminder of the extent of the Roman Empire and uh, this was where Jerusalem is, or is where Jerusalem is, and it was sacked by Titus, and then uh, the booty carried away. So Roman imperial art and architecture, the emperors build projects such as forums, uh, which are civic centers, and sometimes forums included a basilica, we'll talk about that, which could adapt for a variety of administrative functions. So a basilica is a, a structure, a type of building, and we're going to go deep onto the basilica, so I hope you're ready for that. So here is a plan or a model of Rome in 324. Um, there are Rome changes over the centuries, so this one is just this snapshot of 324 CE. And uh, here you can see the Flavian Amphitheater, so you've already seen that. Down here is a building which you are going to see, which is the Pantheon. And these enclosed areas, which you can see several of here, these are what the forums look like, or looked like at the time. So um, we will look at one of them in depth. You can see several temples popping up around. Um, anyway, it's 
to, I love looking at that. It's almost like uh, time travel. So the Basilica Opia was dedicated as a court of law in 113 CE. It is partitioned into a central nave and flanked by two colonnaded aisles. The apses at each end provided imposing settings for judges. Behind it, the column of Trajan provided a location for Trajan's tomb. It is carved with dense relief. So here's a plan of the Forum of Trajan. And this is why this is the only form we're really going to go deep on. And it was built uh, 113, as you can see. This is the Basilica Opia. So what we have is a very oblong uh, precinct here that was all part of his form. But it's intersected right across the middle by this basilica, this huge building. At one end down here is the temple to the divine Trajan. So starting with Caesar Augustus, all of the Roman emperors were determined to be divine, or that means they were gods. And so being a god, they had to have their temple where people could bring offerings. And so Rome gets chock full of temples to, to the various emperors. And so do the cities. I mean, Pompeii had temples to emperors down there too. Um, one of the concessions, the things that... Trajan planned here to, to uh, make it nice for the people, to give them something in exchange for all the offerings, was a marketplace. So attached to the forum over here on the right is the markets of Trajan. And you can see the little shops, these little sections, these little places. Um, so this would have been like an urban shopping mall where you could come... Um, drop off your offering for Trajan, and then uh, step over here and pick up some carrots for dinner or whatever, or a new, new pair of shoes. But this building we will look at in depth, and right behind it, this is an important um, arrangement here, we have two libraries. So Trajan collected all of the known works of the world. Um, one library was a Greek library, and one was a Latin library. And in between the two libraries is the Column of Trajan, which still stands today. And we're going to look at that. So it was carved with reliefs that could have been viewed from the libraries or from the basilica. So a lot of places to look at it. This is a reconstruction of what the basilica might have looked like. So you can see it's a huge space, and it's an, a, a huge enclosed space. It's covered with a timber roof. And there are side aisles with um, double side aisles, meaning that there are two rows of columns going around the outside. And an apse at either end, that's this rounded portion here is the apse. And um, over here is the column of Trajan. This is one of the libraries poking up right there. And here is the column of Trajan, which is still standing today. Amazing amazingly, uh, but the statue that had originally been Trajan on the top has been replaced by a saint, and uh, this would have been the burial place of the mortal remains of the god Trajan. So uh, we're going to look at that column. Now here it is because it's still standing. So this is basically public bragging, where this huge monument was put up and all Trajan wanted to do was brag about his many, many accomplishments or what the Romans had done under his leadership. And you can see, I think you can see from the very bottom, it spirals up. So you could start reading it here and wind your way down and keep going up and it Presumably, it tells a story in linear fashion. Uh, we're not going to look at the whole thing. I know you're going to be terribly disappointed, but we're just going to look at a couple of frames here. So this is from the very bottom, and this is um, the picture over here of a personification of the, the Rhine River. Oh, sorry, the Danube River. This is the Danube. And so... Uh, the, the Greeks did this, the Romans do it as well. They personify nature, 
things like seas and rivers and winds and whatever as people. So this guy's a river and you can see there's things around hanging around his hair that sort of suggest watery stuff. So he's not doing anything. The Roman army is crossing the Danube River and they do it by means of a pontoon bridge. So it shows their construction here. They lash together a group of little boats and then put planks across those lashed together boats and cross the river. It's all sort of shrunken down. It's all condensed so it will fit here. So please don't take this as an indication of the actual size of the Danube River. But uh, this is what would have happened there. And another detail from somewhere else on it that I just happen to like because it looks like war booty. It looks like something the Romans took from their enemy that they defeated somewhere up on, somewhere on that, that column. And it looks like a, an ornament with a wolf head on it, a piece of scale armor here that has been damaged in a battle. Uh, but that would have been valuable war booty and they would bring it back with them. So there you got the column of Trajan. Next, we're going to look at another very important structure that still survives. So um, there's quite a bit standing in Rome today. The Pantheon was a temple dedicated to Mars, Venus, and Julius Caesar. Its rotunda is topped with a huge dome. A rotunda just means a cylindrical building form. So the rotunda was topped with a huge dome. The keystone is replaced with a circular opening or an oculus. The facade was intended to resemble a typical Roman temple. You'll see. The drum is formed by brick arches and concrete. So on the right is an actual photograph uh, taken with a fisheye lens of the interior of the Pantheon. And on the left is an 18th century painting of the interior. So it is uh, perfectly spherical, more or less, and so difficult to photograph from the inside because it's difficult to get far enough back to get the whole thing in your picture. But this artist tried. And so this is the oculus at the top that replaces the keystone of the arch. <clears throat> It's a round plan with uh, several niches. Niches include statues of seven deities. So there were seven niches, <clears throat> and you can see them here in this painting, and they're still over here, of seven different deities. Um, originally, the facade had pedimental sculpture. We'll look at the facade in a little bit. So the dome is concrete and it's supported by massive piers. The oculus is 27 feet in diameter. <clears throat> the concrete, so the dome is made of concrete and it's coffered, so it's sort of textured like a waffle. Uh, that's what coffered ceiling is. So it gets lighter. It, it um, lightens as it goes up. It gets thinner up there. Let me show you some more pictures of this. So this is the facade of it that looks like a Greek or a Roman temple, the, the type that we've seen plenty of and which there are plenty of. So it looks like this temple front is stuck on something completely different, a big cylinder back here. And here's what the dome looks like from the outside. So it's kind of an odd building. It's like two buildings smushed together, two different building types um, smushed together. Six monolithic columns, uh, 16, sorry, monolithic columns in front. Monolithic means that each of these columns is a single piece of stone. They are not separate drums stacked up, but they were carved in their entirety and moved here and erected uh, to make the porch of the Pantheon. So it's, what a huge engineering feat, seriously. Here's a plan, so it shows that porch and the location of all those monolithic columns, the uh, rotunda here with the niches, and the very, very thick walls. So the walls are, are incredibly thick. Here's a cutaway. This is one of my favorite diagrams. It shows how, just how extremely thick that concrete is and how it thins out. 
and there are rings that go around the dome that further strengthen it so make it possible to go up all the way. It's just amazing. And to think it's been standing since it was built, that's um, amazing too. So uh, here's how it looks today from an aerial view from an airplane. So uh, there's there she is. And this is a little piazza in front of it where you can get coffee. There's little restaurants. This is the only Gothic church in Rome, by the way. Side note. Um, but there's this massive, massive structure. And when I say concrete, this is our second huge innovation that the Romans brought to architecture, the advancements. Uh, the first one, of course, was the arch. I think we went into great depth on that, and you got that. And the second is concrete, which was a mixture of uh, this gravelly stuff and cement. I don't know the exact constituents, but they used it a lot. And they would often build a stone face or brick face uh, and build two surfaces and then fill it in with concrete in the middle. So it makes a really strong thick wall that looks like stone. So there you go. And here's, here's uh, where some of it has fallen off, but I just wanted you to be able to see that. So you get the idea that when I say concrete, it's not like a today's building of cast concrete where it just looks like a big gray slab, but they, um, they did dress it up a little with some dressed stone on the outside. That was the Romans. <clears throat> So depicting recognizable likenesses did not preclude idealization as seen in the young Flavian woman. Her features are rendered exquisitely and, not re and required drill work for the holes in the center of the curls of her hair. The contemporary bust of an older woman emphasizes skin marked by time and is more naturalistic, illustrating the Roman interest in verism. So there's still, I'm going to show you two portraits that are roughly contemporary. These are both from the Flavian period, uh, the people who brought us Nero and the Flavian Amphitheater. And this is an extreme hairstyle that was very popular during the Flavian period, where this woman uh, masses some curls up in the front of her head. The author of that last slide argues that she's not this beautiful, that this portrait has been idealized. And I don't know. I don't know what the basis for that judgment is. But anyway, there you go. Uh, but it's a very strange hairdo. You've got to admit that. And here's her contemporary. It might even be her mom, who's uh, slightly older. But we see no idealization here. We see bags under her eyes, sagging chin, everything about her just looks like this must be the way she really looks because um, cause it's not been idealized. So portraits in sculpture and painting. Painted portraits were also popular. A wall painting from Pompeii depicts a married couple holding a scroll and literary tools. The physiognomic uh, differences show effort to individualize both husband and wife. I really like this portrait because it shows us not only what they look like on the outside, what they physically look like, but it shows what they are like as people because uh, they have chosen props or attributes that say something about their inner life. And they are both literate. Uh, the man is holding a scroll stuck up under his chin, um, and the woman is holding this uh, little, it's a, it's a little message board that would have wax in it, and she would uh, write with a stylus in the wax. It was like a telephone or a telegram, and you could write messages to people and send the little the little thing around, and people could read it, and then they would uh, smooth out the wax and reuse it. So it's a great little tool. Uh, so she's showing, they're both showing that they are literate, and um, they can read and write. It's awesome. I have no idea if they were still alive when the, the volcano erupted or if they made it out. No idea. 
And at this point, I'm also going to remind you of this image that I showed you when we were looking at Egypt. And I said that during the Roman period in Egypt, um, there, there was a trend towards painting because the Romans were really into painting. And so the Egyptians started painting these little portraits of the dead person and placing them on mummies. I hope you remember that. And now you can see the connection when you see Roman painting of portraits. This is what was going on in Egypt that made them change their tradition, change what they did. <clears throat> So here's another portrait of an emperor. Now this is considerably later than Caesar Augustus that we looked at. So the period style is different. Marcus Aurelius here has a beard and long curly hair. So he looks completely different from the other emperor. Um, he succeeded Hadrian and he's represented here without armor or weapons in this equestrian statue. Um, this is the only equestrian statue that was preserved from ancient Rome. There were many, but they were all melted down. They were all recycled. Uh, when the Christians came in and became the, the powerful institution that they did, they had very little use for any ancient art that they would have just considered pagan. Um, so they melted it down and reused it in a lot of uh, church environments. So this one was not melted down because of mistaken identity. They thought that he was Constantine, so they preserved him. And the significance of that you will get next in the next uh, module. Actually, we might cover it today. Yeah, I think it is in the, the very end of this one. Sorry. Yes, you will find out about Constantine very soon. So um, Marcus Aurelius' son was Commodus, who has a lot written about him. He was uh, uh, different. He, <laughs> he wanted to be a gladiator. He is the, the young emperor played by Joaquin Phoenix in the movie The Gladiator. And he, so he wants to be a gladiator, and he identified with Hercules. Here he had his portrait done as Hercules. So Hercules has the lion skin of the Nemean lion over his head with the paws, and he carries a club. These are attributes of Hercules. It's such an odd thing for a leader of a country to have himself shown as a superhero because that's what Hercules was in their literature. He was like uh, Superman. So it'd be an the odd equivalent would be for Donald Trump to have his official portrait painted with him in a Superman costume. So I hope you get that. It's like weird. Um, anyway. This is Commodus also showing off that period style of beard. And I should say that beards became the period style be at this time because um, the, the men who grew them thought it made them look wise. They looked philosophical like Plato and Aristotle if they had beards. So a change in the artistic style may have mirrored Diocletian's new abstract form of government. The idea of what was represented seems to have been more important than the physical appearance. This is very important. That's why I put it in a very large font. Art moved towards symbolism and away from naturalism. Big shift. It's going to last all through the Middle Ages. So here is an example of this late style of uh, during Diocletian's reign. So Diocletian became emperor in the uh, third century and during the third century there were lots of emperors and there were lots of assassinations of emperors. So it was extremely dangerous to be an emperor because as soon as you took control somebody would want to kill you. So Diocletian said, um, let's rethink this thing. And he instituted the Tetrarchy where the control, the rule of the Roman Empire was divided between four people. And he divided the empire into halves. Each half was ruled by one man and an assistant. So that means the four people. 
So it was like a president and a vice president in each half. And so uh, Diocletian was the emperor, I believe, um, in the eastern half. And he was called the Caesar. So there was a Caesar and an Augustus in each half. Two Caesars, two Augusti. And this is how the official portrait of these four rulers was done. Um, they're called the Tetrarchs. They are not at all individual likenesses. The, the mode of that veristic representation is no longer practiced. These guys all look the same. They look like cookie cutter. They look like they could be quadruplets um, because it's the idea of four people being equal and four people sharing power that is more important than what they looked like. So you get this very strange period. So here's our symbolic mode, our tetrarchs, late Roman Empire. In these pairings, um, probably the Caesar has the beard and the Augustus is on un unbearded shape face. And this is uh, <laughs> yeah, this is the big idea. So this is a veristic portrait of an emperor earlier where you can say it looked the way he really looked. And these guys do not look real. Just look at these bug eyes. They're like sticking out. It didn't matter. You just symbolize this style. There's a lot written about this decline or this evolution of style. Um, but I'm trying to give it to you very succinctly and very clearly. So, um, as Diocletian, uh, oh, I didn't tell you that the, uh, another idea of the Tetrarchy was that after so many years of rule, the two head Caesars would step down and their assistants would step up and new assistants would be named. So there would be a rotation. There would be, in other words, a term limit to their rule and there would be this constant changeover so nobody would be a sitting target for too long. So what a good plan. So Diocletian ruled his years. He said, okay, it's time for me to go. And so he retired. He built this fabulous palace uh, and retired to that. And then all hell broke loose and everybody said, Forget that, I want to be the king of all the Roman Empire. So there was this vying for power. Um, and it, it gets a little complicated, but I'm go going to just sort of uh, succinctly again tell you the story that one of the Augusti was Constantius Chlorus, who lived in Germany, so he was in the western half of the Roman Empire. And his son was Constantine, who was a general with the Roman army stationed up in the north of England. So when Diocletian stepped down and there was chaos in Rome and uh, uh, Maximian decided to take over, or sorry, not Maximian, Maxentius decided to take over the rule, uh, sole rule of the empire, Constantine's army said, you know, you would be a really good emperor. You have a right to it. Your dad was an Augustus. Why don't you go down to Rome and just take over? And so he said, okay, I'll do that. And he took his army on these nicely paved Roman roads and marched them down to Rome. And I'm, I'm narrating this story because it is a, a turning point in history. From This really changes everything from here on out in Europe. So... Um, Constantine came down to Rome. He was camped outside of Rome with his army. And inside, inside the city was uh, his enemy, Maxentius, or the guy who was on the throne. And uh, Maxentius knew that Constantine was out there and that there was going to be a big battle between the two armies. So Maxentius had to rally his, uh, the, the army outside of the city. And the night before the battle, Constantine had a dream. And that's where these illustrations come from. This comes from a medieval reliquary um, that illustrate the story. So it's to told from 
uh, visually from a medieval perspective here. So here's uh, this roundel that shows Constantine sleeping the night before the battle. And this angel appears to him in a dream. And it says, uh, in hoc vinque, which means, I think that's a vinque, it might be vinky, which means uh, you will win under this sign or be victorious under this sign. And he's pointing to the cross, which is medieval. This is the sign that was current at the time. This was the symbol of Christianity. Um, but Constantine recognized in his dream what the angel was talking about. It was the sign of Christianity. Uh, this, by the way, is where the round doll is. And there's six of them on that piece. So um, Constantine got up the next day and he told his soldiers to put the sign of the Christians on their battle standards and go into battle. He took this as divine intervention, as God interfering in history. So he went into battle and here's what that piece showed us the battle was like. So here's Constantine's army. There's their battle standard with the cross on top. And here's the battle, uh, the army of Maxentius, and they're labeled here Maxentius and Constantinus Victor down here, the, the victorious army of Constantine. I know they look very medieval. Like I said, it's, it's a medieval thing. Um, and this, this uh, was a piece that commemorated the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. So that's what the battle was called, where Constantine defeated Maxentius. Then Constantine came into Rome. He took over um, the emperorship from Maxentius. Maxentius had already started building his own basilica, which Constantine renamed the the uh, Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine. I think it's very generous of Constantine to give him any credit after all that. Um, but because Constantine thought that the Christian God had given him this victory and given him this, this position of power, he allowed Christianity to be practiced freely. So he said, we have to stop the persecution of Christians. We cannot kill them. They must be allowed to freely practice their religion. They do not need to bring offerings to the Roman temples anymore. We've got to leave them alone because their God blessed me with a victory. That's what I mean by it changes the history of Europe, this one battle. So here's a diagram of the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine. So um, you can see what's left of it is three barrel vault side sections here. The main part of the basilica is destroyed. It was groin vaulted, and then there were three barrel vaulted bays over on the side. There was one apse here, and the apse held a giant statue of Constantine because this was a court of law, and if Constantine could not be present, anything that happened there would still be official because he had a, an avatar sitting there in his stead. So I'm going to show you that. Um, this is another plan of that basilica with the three barrel vaulted bays, and here's the giant statue of Constantine. So as long as that was there, everything was official. So I bet you're wondering about that statue. So um, there it is, what's left of it. Pieces were saved. It was a huge statue. It's thought that the trunk of the body was made of wood or possibly straw and it didn't survive. But everything exposed, like his extremities, his feet, his hands, his head, his arm, his leg, would have all been made of stone and they would have survived. So we have them. It's a miracle. And they are assembled in a courtyard in a museum in Rome. So we have a giant foot. That's my daughter again. And Constantine's head, his uh, inner arm, his finger gesturing upward. So it's great. Great stuff. Now, look at the head. Look at the face. It's done in that same sort of symbolic mode. It's not quite as extreme as the Tetrarchs, but I really don't think you would be able to identify Constantine on the street 
based on what his portrait looks like. So this also reflects that shift to the symbolic mode. Very important. Look how big those eyes are, how strong that chin is. This is not a, a naturalistic. It is not a veristic portrait at all. And just to remind you, there is one there that looks like a human being. And Constantine, by contrast, is weird. So Constantine also built an arch for himself to commemorate his victory over Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge, and it has three arches, three entryways for his army to go through. Um, but it's much more than that. It's a hodgepodge of pieces that he ripped off from other monuments, so he's borrowing a lot of earlier art. He's borrowing the glory of the greatness of the Roman Empire, um, because right now the artists are not making good stuff. So he's taking these figures up here, and these figures in the roundels. He's making some stuff original. We're going to look at that here. So these roundels are from an earlier um, emperor. These are from Hadrian's reign, I believe. And this um, this frieze down here is is was made by artists for Constantine. So this is new. These round ones are old, and this is new. So look at the style of the figures up above, and they look uh, well-proportioned classical figures uh, like we would expect to see, but the figures down below look stumpy and doll-like. They have become symbols. It's a symbol of a crowd. There's no individuality. Even the figure here that was Constantine in the middle is not a likeness of him. Nothing is a likeness. It's all just a little... Just think of them as stick figures representing a bunch of people because that's really all the detail they had. Uh, so this shows the two styles side by side. Pretty dramatic. And there's the Arch of Constantine today. It stands very close to the Flavian Amphitheater, as you can see. So you can kill two birds with one stone there. And that brings us to the very end of Rome, but stay tuned for next time when you will see what happened after Constantine told the Christians they could come out of hiding and practice um, their religion. <laughs>